All right, this is your Gaza War Sitrep Day 125, World War Three. I'm here with John Elmer. And um, hey, John. Hey, Justin. Thanks for having me. So we've got our late night uh, sit rep. We're going to cover the various um, things. But our main our main um, task tonight is to go over um, very carefully uh, Hamas's reply to the so-called Paris proposal that was made by Israel. And then Hamas gave a very detailed reply. And then Netanyahu rejected it and is now um, planning to invade Rafa. Uh, so before we before we get into that, uh, I want to go over just the other, the various fronts. So and the, and there's interesting the interesting things I want to do in terms of talking about the fronts have to do with a lot of summaries. So John, on your page, uh, on your Twitter feed, you posted this Hamas uh, infographic uh, outlining. It was basically about the use of their rocket propelled grenade system, the Yassin 105. And uh, I'm sh- I know most of you don't read Arabic, uh, but look at the numbers <laughs> and the icons and they tell you the story without even the need to read uh the, the arabic so there's a hundred or 1108 um hits that they're uh recording in this infographic 962 of them of merkava tanks 55 of them are armored personnel carriers 74 bulldozers i mean how many bulldozers are in Israel's bulldozer fleet? That would be something that I would be very curious. It's got to be a admit to that number. It's got to be a big chunk because when they, I, I don't think you go into you people go into a war planning to lose tanks for sure, planning to lose armored personnel carriers definitely, but bulldozers are generally something that the Israel, I mean, not <laughs> very few armies use bulldozers, okay, but Israeli army uses bulldozers on the assumption that they're safe, uh, at least from anything but small arms fire. They, they're armored bulldozers, but 74 bulldozers is a lot. Um, three excavators and 14 um, military jeeps. So that's the summary. I was actually planning to try to, try to, um, make a summary of this and try to count based on my own uh, aggregations of various summaries that I was able to find online. But then uh, it was all done uh, for me by the uh, armed group. That's So I just sent you a graphic on your WhatsApp. I don't know how you, if you can transfer that, but it's the. Okay. Yeah. Talk while I transfer it. it, 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 It's the um, International Institute for Strategic Studies releases every year. Uh, this book called The Military Balance, and it's um, essentially the order of battle for every country in the world. Oh. Um, and so there's a segment, a section on Israel that lists its equipment type. Mm. And so, but interestingly, it doesn't list the D9 bulldozer. armored bulldozer. Because I don't, maybe it's not a, maybe they don't consider it a, Military. I don't know. I mean, it's well, not. You see it down there in the engineering and maintenance core vehicles. There it is, D9R. But if we look at that, so we're seeing the E, those little funny E's mean an estimate because Israel uh, mm-hmm. runs a sensor on all their military equipment. We don't even know how thick the armor is on the Merkava. It's all secret. So, But they're saying roughly 400 Mark IVs, which are the ones they feel fully confident deploying in the Gaza Strip, and 700 Mark IIIs, which is what we started seeing in the Gaza Strip, um, like after the first month or so, when it was obvious that they were being degraded. Um, And so, and then they have, then they have 200 more mark fours all in store so it's not clear that those are battle ready uh, but those numbers right there suggest 1100 right so they're scraped they're they're already they're already below divisions in lebanon they're in the lower half of the barrel already then yeah and yeah they're not produced you can't these are not you can't churn hundreds of these off the line in a month no 
and, and when you're talking about the numbers as large as that, if you're saying like, so Kassam said destroyed or damaged, I probably right. wouldn't use that word. I probably would have used a word like strikes. Hit, like, yeah. Yeah, hits, strikes. Um, because the, the tanks do have active protection systems that do deal with some of the incoming rounds. Some of the incoming rounds just don't pierce the armor. Um, but on the other hand, uh, smaller shots hit in the right place can be a uh, like a, a movement kill. Like the, mm -hmm. the, the tank can't move anymore. Yeah. Um, and it's not clear where these tanks are either, right? Like we're starting to see people when they went back home to their houses in the north, um, in, in areas in the north that they found we've seen on social media pictures of tanks um, blown up that are buried in rubble, which suggests that the Israelis came afterwards and destroyed the tanks so that they can't end up in the museum oh, or whatever. How very Hannibal of them, yeah, destroying equipment as well. So there's uh, a there's a bunch of un unanswered questions um, that we have where uh, that that I have at this point in the war is we we're not sure how these evacuations are working. The Israelis are talking about they just the other day said that one of their units um, had withdrawals. You mean? Oh no no you mean evacuated by a helicopter? Well, this was ground evacuations, but mm -hmm. then they have the helicopter evacuations that say that there's fifteen hundred more of those operations. So they're talking about 3,000 medevacs, and on their IDF right. site, they have 1,500 injured. So they're either taking two medevac flights for each wounded soldier, or they're lying to us about their casualties. Well, and to what degree they are, I think, is the, the, the question, not whether they are or not. Aria, once again, never, never let a sit rep go by without uh, quoting Aria. Aria says... Now that's A R Y J E A Y on Twitter. Are you saying? Uh, I didn't see this on um, their feed. Uh, I didn't see this on on in Yadiyat Aharoniad, but he says that Yadiyat Aharoniad revealed the true no number of casualties among the Israeli army, amounting to thirteen thousand casualties, and they're considering changing conscription laws. Thirteen. That means killed and wounded. Can you Still throw that's... that back up one more time? Just quickly. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Let me do that. Yeah. 13. They're saying, he's saying, they're saying 13,000 casualties, 55% of them being reserved. Since the start of the war. Since the start of okay, the war. Okay. So yeah. I think that that, I mean, those were the numbers that Nasrallah was using too. He was saying 10,000 casualties in Gaza and 2,000 casualties on the Northern Front. So yep. those numbers seem to match with that. Um, and these are the kind of things we're taking these stats um, from the Israelis that are talking about something other than casualties and putting uh, and making mm -hmm. us deduce from that what what the casualties are. But like if it's 20 percent death of a casualty, right? Like you're still you're in the thousands, you're two, you know, 2000 or more dead uh, you know, killed in action. And that's more than even the maximalist claim of of the numbers killed on October 7th. So, and I haven't heard anyone say more people, more Jews have died since in, in the war in Gaza than any time since the Holocaust, which was the claim about October 7th, so Just right? for the audience, the Israelis claim at this point right now today, they have acknowledged 227 killed, which incidentally- That's absurd. That num in the ground war. Yeah, that's- In the ground just, war alone. That's ridiculous. And incidentally, that is, or not so incidentally, that number is greater than the number of troops killed, IDF troops killed in combat in South Lebanon from 1985 to 2000. So just to give you a sense of the scale of what we're what we're dealing with in this this war, the scale is enormous, both from the resistance and of course of this industrial slaughter that Israel is carrying out. Um, okay, let's do another infographic. We have Hezbollah's infographic. Oh yeah, Hezbollah did one too. Hezbollah did an infographic. Again, don't worry about reading the Arabic, but 
um, look at the numbers. Uh, so on the left, you have the things that they were firing, right? Um, how many of different kinds of, like, so 244 missiles. Uh, or I can call it up here in English. Separate missile attacks. Um, they think they've hit 56 armored vehicles. And then all these different types of out outposts that's in the middle. Um, drones. Do, do you have the... Yeah, do you want me to rip it off? So it's 56 vehicles, 28 of them tanks, 26 command centers, 178 points in sites and settlements. So that would be like military positions. 500 settlement homes, which is actually a number that the Israelis confirmed a couple days ago to. Um, 237 technical equipment. So that's the poles we've watched them blow up. 311 troop positions, two factories, 25 border post walls. Um, this is interesting. 14 artillery batteries. So they're hitting... Um, with precision wow. guided missiles, artillery batteries, which didn't happen in the previous war, um, and two Iron Dome systems that they've hit, mm -hmm. five drones, um, and, and these is, are the it's... weapons used. Three hundred. These are the weapons used, not the number of projectiles fired. So no, so independent operations. There was three hundred and twenty-three artillery operations, two hundred and forty-four surface-to-surface -surface missiles. Mm -hmm. um, 68 sniper attacks, 40 air defense versus Israeli drones, um, 23 of Hezbollah suicide drone attacks, 385 guided missiles. Presumably that means, I would presume that's anti-tank missiles. Yeah. Um, anti-tank guided nine missiles. Nine engineering weapons and 72 other various weapons. So... Um, that totaled, and the other interesting thing was they said that there was 188 attacks that have been shown in 98 videos. <laughs> wow. So they told us how much we've so actually it, seen on camera. What percentage of it we've seen, which is a high percentage. I mean, it's not, they're making sure to include their greatest hits, literally. Yeah, at any um, other time, that would be that would be a full-on war and also just you know to note that that hezbollah can carry out that many attacks without israel expanding and escalating the war if you can imagine back in the day yeah um, the deterrence uh dynamic is in hezbollah's favor not in israel's favor at this point the yeah. salah aruri assassination in beirut was uh, across a red line but it didn't target anything hezbollah um, other than that, Israel's taken these 3,400 attacks and um, are, are only marginally escalating in the sense that they're still fighting in that border area. They're not taking it deeper into Lebanon. Yeah. And, um, okay, let me do a couple more. There is a, there is a kind of, as with, you know, for some reason, Yemen, and it's anything but funny, just there's something about the way that the Ansar Allah kind of comports themselves where they provide oh, yeah. some kind of it's not comic relief exactly, but it's it's definitely it's some close to that. It's definitely some kind of relief. So so um, this one is uh the morning tide. Uh, apparently it's a British ship and they change their, I don't know what you call it, like the transponder or whatever it is, uh, to say that they're a Chinese owner ship. So they're trying to they're trying to pass the Ansarullah blockade by claiming that they're some other uh nationality and, and they're hoping that by saying they're Chinese, they're gonna they're gonna get um they're gonna get away with it. But of course, this ship was attacked by Ansar Allah, and um, and they're not easily fooled by these kinds of ruses. And I think, I don't know, it's just there's always something new from the Yemen front, and it's always something like this. It's always some ridiculous thing that the Western countries are trying to do. Um, and then, but let's do Iraq, because Iraq has been... 
something else. Uh, there was the we we covered the attack on the base supposedly in Jordan. Maybe it was in Syria. It's that three border base, the kind of base that the Americans like to have that is on three countries, one of which they have permission for. And uh, it was attacked by the biggest Iraqi resistance um, group, uh, Kata'eb Hezbollah. And then immediately that group's leader said, um, we won't be attacking U.S. troops for the time being. So we already talked about that. But I, I guess yesterday or the day before, the Americans did a really spectacular, high-profile drone strike on two of the leaders from this group, uh, assassinating them in Baghdad, which has uh, enraged people in Iraq uh, all over. Not just today? Oh, maybe if no, I, I have, I have a, I have a, I have a scene here from February seventh. But yes, the days are blurring. I, I think uh, I made a day hundred and twenty two video that on day hundred and twenty three, and so I'm trying to, I'm trying to catch up to what day it is. The time difference doesn't help. The time difference um, doesn't help. Abu Bakr al Sadi and Hajj Arkan al Alayawi, uh, leaders from Kataib Hezbollah, and there's the car uh, that was destroyed. So they were in a car. The car was bombed from the air, and um, yeah, are they meeting? Were they be people that were meeting with the Iraqi government to try to figure out um, some sort of deal about the exit of troops? I mean, I wonder where the Americans got the intelligence for right, that strike. Right. It's it's usually during some kind of diplomatic initiative that they get the intelligence that they need to kill these people. Um, but there is during, during a technical ceasefire after the people ceasefire. say that they're going to hold their fire laterally. Yeah. So no honor, no honor, and also. I mean, talk about behaving like your days are numbered in Iraq. Like they they know they're not going to be there much longer. This is it's it reminds me of the way they did those really bizarre airstrikes in Afghanistan after they had already left. You know, it's it's this kind of yeah. Um, I mean, that's a whole that's a whole other can of worms. Like, what what will it look like when the Americans leave Iraq? Is that going to be an orderly? Like, I, I what's mean, that going to look like? I guess the only, bases the, are out in the desert. The only practice they have is Afghanistan. So that's the only thing I can, the only recent practice they have in withdrawing. So that'll be like thieves in the night, right? They'll just. Yeah, where they turned the electricity off at Bagram Air Base. And that's how the, um, the Afghans knew was when they were sitting in their base and the power went out and they went, hey, what the heck's going on? And they went and looked around to see what fuse was broken and they saw the Americans flying off. They left, pretty their, unbelievable po story. They left their Pokemon Go icons. Yeah. Just I mean, stranded. they left in pretty similar way that the Israelis left South Lebanon. The Israelis left South Lebanon in the in April 2000 in such a hurry that they left their computers plugged in and they left their helmets hanging up. They just they just literally ran down the hill. There's only one way that they know how to leave, and that's probably how it's going to be here. Um, the Iraqi, the, com the spokesman for the commander in chief of the Iraqi armed forces, though, made a really, really harsh statement. I mean, you know, they're, they've all, they've been, they've been in various levels of harshness saying that it's time for the Americans to go, but this is very direct. Um, you know, this path pushes the Iraqi government more than ever before to end the mission of this coalition, which has become a factor of instability for Iraq. Our armed forces cannot help but carry out their constitutional duties and tasks that require preserving the security of Iraqis in the land of Iraq from all threats. So, I mean, it's it's like open season, basically. Yeah, you're killing um, you're killing people in the army that you're ostensibly in the country by invitation of. Yeah, and now they're gonna. I mean, yeah, nobody's gonna be punished in Iraq for killing American soldiers. So they've just put even as if there wasn't targets on all of them before, but like they're, yeah, their days are numbered in Iraq. It's very clear. But also just the Americans just seem to want to escalate in these situations. They yeah. They don't seem necessary. <laughs> Caitlin Johnstone uh, is this person on Twitter that she she's a writer. She said something really. She's she, she's really good at writing tweets, and 
she had this tweet where she was like, they're continuously saying they don't want escalation against the people that they're continuously bombing. She's like, it's one of the weirdest things going on in the world right now. And it's true. It's like such a, they make a speech saying we don't want escalation. And then they do this high profile assassination drone strike on, um, on this, on the, on a street, on a civilian car in Baghdad of leaders of the organization that they say they don't want to escalate against. Like, um, yeah, and okay. they, they carried out the first round of airstrikes right after the repatriation of the family's bodies so that the families are in the funeral and they're like sending the missiles out as some kind of like theater. Uh, honor guard or yeah, like the 21 gun salute. Um, okay, a couple of other notes from the israeli side um there's a lot of a lot of a lot of uh civilian activism in israel uh dedicated to the noble goal of stopping humanitarian aid from going into gaza so civilians unarmed protests blocking we won't let them go uh there's this uh one of these um accounts that i follow uh big underscore brother seven <laughs> um uh 60% of settlers supporting the support the blocking of humanitarian aid into Gaza and 90% 98% support the war. I don't know. I don't I didn't see the 60% where they got the 60% statistic, but there's a quote from someone who follows uh Hebrew media. Uh they go by on Twitter, I really hate you. But he says the org it was a quote from the organizer. At this time, Karab Shalom Crossing has been blocked for the passage of aid and supply trucks to Hamas. The people of Israel won. So this is what this is a victory for the people of Israel, uh, according Incidentally, to Incidentally, in a closed military zone. So the only way that those people can get into that area is by the army literally allowing them, facilitating them to get into there. So to block that that's aid. the idea of a protest this is how a, a popular protest works you get permission from the army to block something the army doesn't want to do anyway um, and they're doing it for real too it's not just symbolic there i saw footage of one of them like hanging on the front of a truck like physically stopping the aid to a population that more than 80 percent of the population oh 80 percent of the world's catastrophic famine exists in gaza and that stats like two weeks old so we're two weeks worse um the icj uh, nicaragua is going to intervene in the international court of justice to try to go after the western countries that are uh facilitating um genocide so that's another Little Nicaragua had an ICJ wrinkle? case go in their favor, right? About the mining of the yeah, yeah, Managua yeah. port. They know all about the ICJ. Um, so, okay. So that, I think that covers the headlines that I wanted to go through. There's a, there's a, there's a headline I saw about Egypt it has nothing to do with the war, but apparently Egypt is selling a whole town to the United Arab Emirates. Have you seen this one? No. Egyptian official confirms 22 billion sale of Mediterranean town to UAE investors. So they're selling, they're selling parts of Egypt off. Um, anyway, I was just looking at the Egypt news and found that. <laughs> anyway, the the I I did well. There is something that I wanted to say about Sinai because I've been reading about Egypt and. 1967 war and i'm going to go into the 1973 war and um the uh the whole um project of displacing israel i mean palestinians into the sinai it occurred to me that that's basically israel asking egypt for the sinai back because if palestinians are displaced into sinai Israel is going to want to retain security control over those Palestinians. It's going to want to make, make sure that it controls where they go, where they can't go. It's not just going to like let them go and assimilate into Egyptian society or create some kind of giant city in the Sinai where they, 
you know, get dual Palestinian Egyptian passports and just live a jolly life. Like Israel would want to control every aspect of their lives as they do with Gaza. So it's just, it would just be Egypt selling. I guess there is a connection. <laughs> it would just be Egypt selling the Sinai to Israel. And then, uh, and then Palestinians would start attacking from the Sinai and then Israel would start invading the Sinai. And then that would be the end of the Israel, Egypt, uh, peace accords from the 70s camp david i mean it's I the realm of speculation but i i i can't my brain can't imagine what it would look like for palestinians to get expelled from the gaza strip like what does it look like they burst down the door they burst down the wall and flood in to the other side of the border like right. i don't know how i don't know how many people would do that i don't think right. they're going to do that right um well, I guess if they imagine this, the way I imagine it, or the way I imagine Netanyahu imagines it, and Gallant and whoever those other people are, they storm Rafa, and then they, and then they let they create a corridor for the civilians to flee, and end up in Rafa, Egypt. Rafa, Egypt, and then and then what? They throw the tents cities, up yeah, and on the border. Cities. But I don't know. I don't know. I guess that's the plan. It needs a lot of things to go right for Israel. And uh, it needs a lot of active Egyptian cooperation. It's not just a matter of letting it happen. Right. Yeah. It I think as we get Egypt. into this ceasefire proposal, we're going to see how many uh, spots there are that really need to be figured out and the Egyptian yeah. and Israeli uh, guards on each of the borders definitely uh, complicates all of these questions. So, okay, perfect. Uh, before before we um, before we get into the text, before we analyze, before we get into our uh, textual analysis, uh, there's a guest. You've had this. Uh, you've had this guest on um, Electronic Intifada live streams a number of times. I think. Uh, Abdel Jawad Omar. Yeah. And yeah. he had a pretty cool short thread a uh, couple of days, maybe yesterday, uh, where he says, historically, Israel employed a strategy in negotiations with four interlinked elements. One, mediators, while distinct actors remained dishonest brokers, pushing Israel's agenda on the Palestinians. So that's Qatar, Egypt, etc. Waiting to see Palestinian responses to conjure up its own response. To, they didn't commit to any mediated resolution until Palestinians show that they're willing to commit, employing dual tracks to see whether within the same camp there might be others. So they're trying to divide the Palestinian team. And then fourth, they say yes, but at the last minute, they undo everything that um, was proposed up to that point. So his analysis is that Israel wants three things, maintain its forced disposition, hard to do when you're being attrited at the rates that you are, Retrieve as many Israeli prisoners as it can. The only way that's going to happen is through negotiation. I think they've at least probably figured that part out. And keep the war open even if delayed. Well, that's just standard. Israel would keep the war open forever. That's how Israel has existed since 1948, keeping the war open, right? Um, and then Israel's need for the war to continue is tied to its understanding that any end of the war will bring about a reckoning it's not ready to deal with. I mean, I, you know, I, I've heard that before. I don't know how explicit that is in Israel's analysis. I think it's a lot. I, I think I, what I see is a lot of them just doing what they do, doing what they're good at, doing what they love, you know, killing, displacing, um, attacking civilians. I don't see it as like they don't want to make peace because they know that Netanyahu will be gone and face corruption charges if he makes peace because when do they have they ever made peace it's not like they would otherwise make peace if if it wasn't yeah i think corruption peace would be charges. a strong word but i think that the from from what i understand from the latest reading is that of the knesset is that um if netanyahu falls they can there's somebody that can put together a coalition um, mm -hmm. largely intact. I think there was three other parties, something like that to go in. And 
just for the yeah. audience that's not familiar with the Knesset, it's a, a parliament with um, an enormous number of parties and often like single issue parties, like the Homeland Party, that's only platform is expelling Palestinians. But there's also like the, um, you know, the senior citizens party. Um, and so then, then they get into government by forming coalitions. And in order to get these parties into the coalition, you promise them certain portfolios, which is how these extreme right wing guys like uh, ben Gavir oh, get these yeah. interior ministry portfolios because he'll, he says, unless I'm interior ministry, I'm not going to be in the government. And then you don't have a government. Yeah. Um, so there isn't, the government doesn't need to fall in order right. to carry out the first step of the prisoner exchange, right. which I think is something that's very achievable and something that the Palestinians and the Israelis both, um, would welcome, I think, if they were thinking clearly about the situation. There's a group of people who are still remaining in custody in Gaza who should have been released in the first exchange that happened back in November. They were supposed to be part of that deal. And for whatever reasons, um, the last couple days of that deal broke down. So there's some number of uh, older men, mm -hmm. um, and apparently there's still some civilians, although we're not totally sure who, because the Israelis believe that as many as 35 of them are dead mm -hmm. um, out of the 135 that are left. So They might have killed them. Um, okay, so let's get to the ceasefire deal, the rejected ceasefire deal. Um, when when I saw this, John, before I heard that Netanyahu rejected it, I thought, this is what they have to do, and this is how it's going to have to be, but Israel's not ready for this. And I thought, when 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 Hamas said, you know, we're we're engaging with it uh, in a in a positive light, we're going to reply tomorrow or whatever it was, I was like. Okay. And then I read it and I was like, oh, I see. So they're, they were like, this is a really good proposal. We just have a few changes. And then they basically changed it to everything they had been proposing all along. So it's, it's not like a, it's not like a document where they're meeting the Israelis halfway and like saying, we're going to let you occupy half of Gaza forever. And, you know, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, Kassam really wrote this document. Um, so, so, okay, so basically, I'll run through this here. The basics are that it happens in three stages. Each stage is 45 days. The first stage is completing the civilian exchange. The second stage is the soldiers, um, the Israeli soldiers um, exchanged for thousands of Palestinians. And then the third stage is the bodies, and then that's when the the, the the trajectory for some sort of peace agreement happens. But now within this document, the Palestinians have embedded, and, and this document was approved by all the resistance factions, which is again something that we've been talking about on this show about how um, we believe that after this war, there's going to be an attempt at a national unity government put together by Sinwar, who when he came out of prison, was determined to end the Fatah-Hamas split in the Palestinian national movement and has acted to do so in this time. Um, so the beginning, um, this is my interpretation of the Arabic text. So um, so the, the first stage is complete the civilian exchange. Um, and then from there, all of the, less, the rest of the list that you see there that they're all affixed in an addendum. So there's stage one, stage two, stage three, and then underneath there's an addendum that says these things have to happen before stage two kicks in, which mm -hmm. is a really smart way to write the document for the Palestinians, particularly because Israel is so dishonorable in these kind of negotiations that um, the main thing the Palestinians were worried about was that they they would hand over the prisoners or the, the, not worried about but the thing that they wouldn't do is hand over the prisoners before there's some kind of uh 
you yeah. know, not, not for some aspirational thing or something three months in the future. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So it begins by the IDF withdraws from the population areas. And that it seems to make sense because we've seen in the last week, well, the intelligence ministers of the CIA, Shabak, Egyptian intelligence, um, Mossad, and the Qatari prime minister were meeting. Israel reinvaded the north. So they moved into the population centers in order that in a peace agreement, in a ceasefire agreement, let's try to keep our language tight here. We're talking about a ceasefire. We're actually talking about a pause right now. Mm. Um, we're not talking peace. Um, so the withdrawal is is something that armies do often before a ceasefire, which is you advance as far as you can go so that once you're fixed in position, you have the maximum amount of territory. Um, so that's something that Israel went into the, they saw that Shifa hospital, the main hospital in Gaza city was being reconstituted. So they went in and raided it and dismantled it again. So removed from the population centers and Kassam put the language on this um, for them to move back out of the population centers into the buffer zone in a disposition that allows for the exchange of prisoners, which is the next point, restrict aerial reconnaissance, no aerial reconnaissance, no drones flying over. Um, my shorthand is let Kassam work. So the idea is that no aerial surveillance by either side during this period so that the Palestinians can find the prisoners move around um, without giving up their positions um, in the military conflict. So that's a concession by the Israelis to keep their people safe. Uh, the next one is that the population moves home immediately. There's no more of this trapped in the corner of the Gaza Strip by Rafa and being attacked. That's not happening. Um, and then they get into these yeah, things that I just would... To, just to say, like, the overall dynamic of this genocide and i you know if you want to make it distinct from the war like the way that israel has targeted civilians has been they attacked them in the north and told them to go to khan yunus which is sort of central then they attacked khan yunus and, and they told them to go to rafa and which is in the south and now they're talking about attacking rafa which is now three times the population that it usually has and it's also always been like the rest of Gaza, fairly densely populated with 300,000 people there. So now there's a million people there in temporary housing and there, and Israel's planning to raid or not raid, but uh, storm uh, Rafa. Now, if, um, yeah. And yeah, the way that the evacuations have happened has been to push everybody out of the area, not so like almost like a toothpaste, like you're rolling up toothpaste. You don't, yeah. it's not whack-a-mole where you tell them to go from one area and some people go north, some people go south. It's a constant push out of, yeah. out of the north. Nobody's allowed to go back home. When people in Khan Yunus who are from the north got pushed out of Khan Yunus, they didn't go to the middle camps. They went yeah. south to Rafa. So that's a key um, part of this is that the first thing on the list for the Palestinians after the prisoner exchange um, is the parameters they they was that people back. are allowed to move home and immediately. The other thing I want to say about that is members. we've been talking about this many times, but like the point is the way Israel presents it is we're squeezing people south so that we can get Hamas from evacuated areas in fact they're squeezing people south to better attack them to more like they're not they're not evacuating people to fight the battle they're evacuating people to concentrate them so that they can better attack the civilians yeah well they haven't allowed people to return to their homes which is yeah. that that's the part that is suspect that doesn't seem yeah. Um, that that seems Israel can't talk its way around in terms of ethnic cleansing because if if you were just a asking people to leave the battlefield, they should be yeah. able to return home as soon as possible. Right. This is 1948. Kassam, yeah, this is that's always what Kassam puts at the top of the list. Yeah. And then all of these next ones, we could put them all basically. So there's the first points are about the prisoner exchange. 
the second point's about moving home. And then everything that you see on this page all the way down effectively amounts to open the borders. Yeah, rest, um, but they put uh, them restoration in the order. of life. Yeah. Restoration of the hospitals, restoration of civil defense. They want civil defense equipment in so that they can dig out their family members. Yeah. Um, both sides, no reconnaissance during this period, no fighting by both sides. Kassam put both sides. They didn't ask Israel to do something that they aren't mm -hmm. doing. So that was interesting in their proposal as well. Um, they want 200,000 tents, which are currently being blocked because of their dual use items, according to the Israelis. So they want 200,000 tents and 60,000 mm -hmm. sort of mobile homes, like mm -hmm. I guess the British call them caravans or, um, but like, a like an Atco trailer kind of thing. Yeah. Um, 50,000 a week. That's the tune. They want tents at 50,000 a week for this period that could last for 135 days. Um, and then restore electricity, restore telecommunications, restore water. And again, when we say restore, we're talking about the Palestinians with their own hands restoring this. No, they're not asking for aid from Israel. Israel doesn't provide any of these things. Insofar as Israel does, it's purchased for outlandish prices from the Israelis. The Israelis make people think that it's them giving aid to Gaza. It's not. Yeah. It's them controlling what goes into Gaza, separate from their um, uh, monopolistic deals that they force on uh, Gaza farmers to sell and import their stuff. Um, so water and civic infrastructure. And then here we get into the honor of the agreement. No arrests of previously released people. Because we've already seen Israel go around in the West Bank and arrest several people that were released in the first round of the prisoner exchange, which is just such a, I think we're saying it too much, but dishonorable. Well, yeah, such I mean, the, the Russians, apparently the Russians came up with some phrase where they said the United States is non-agreement capable. And I mean, that's, I think, you know, that's what yeah, we've no, come that's to. A good, that's a good way to phrase it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no rearrests. Honor the agreement. Five hundred plus trucks a day of aid. Right now, they're getting one sixteenth of that. Mm -hmm. um, open borders, not for everybody. Open borders for wounded to seek care in hospitals abroad. So none of these asks are anything other than. Um, so up till this point, none of the asks are anything other than the bare minimum human rights that you would yeah, expect. This is what everybody in the world has. What everyone would expect and everyone should agree to. Um, and then the open borders, it doesn't say open borders for family reunification or any yeah. of those legitimate rights that the Palestinians would have at a free border. It doesn't say that. It says open border at Rafa for wounded care yeah, uh, and that's nothing. Just... That's not that's not a border with Israel. In case yeah. people don't know that, that's a border with Egypt. So it's none of Israel's business. But of course, Israel also controls that border as well. That's right. And then this part was a little a little unclear because it it read to me as though I mean these are the things they'll negotiate over. Um, mm -hmm. But it read to me as though. Hamas has dropped the all for all um, element of the exchange and that what they're looking for is the release of people arrested after October 7th. So the people that were swept up in these raids, the truckloads of people that were in shelters in Gaza that were tortured and stripped in the street that are now, <clears throat> excuse me, that are now in camps, all of those people plus 1,500 prisoners 500 of whom are chosen by Hamas and who have life or long sentences. So you can't mm -hmm. omit. Israel often tries to omit people that have shorter sentences or longer sentences and release people who are about mm -hmm. to get out of prison anyway. Mm -hmm. And so that 500 that you see there, that's the, the story behind that story is that that's the leadership of the movements. That's where Marwan Barghouti comes in. That's where Ahmed mm -hmm. Sadat of the PFLP come in. Um, the, the ability to release the national 
leadership of the various factions and the cadre as well that fought in the Second Intifada. Um, so that's what um, Hamas is targeting there. And then this is another important part, that the prisoner exchange, and this was the same for Gilad Shalit, it's mutual and simultaneous. There's not, we give you two and then you give us two. It's mutual, mm -hmm. simultaneous releases. Which I think um, it was was how it was done in um, in November, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 Well, there's been a couple of times that Hamas, that Qassam um, released prisoners without anything. Like they mm -hmm. released on humanitarian right. grounds. And I don't know if we talked about it on this show, but there was the, the prisoner who was released... Um, um, what was her name? Amina Moshe, um, who talked about when she went into the tunnel, she walked for five hours, she got down into the tunnel and she met Sinwar and Sinwar said, oh, you're going to be going home today or tomorrow. Yeah. Um, so so that's that's how Kassam believed that this was going to go. Uh, so, yeah, it's I, I, I think... It's okay, so pretty... wait, hold on. So then, if oh. all those things happen, if all that list yeah. happens, yeah, then stage two begins, and then stage two is where the soldiers are released, and that's mm -hmm. where the Palestinians are going to aim to get thousands and thousands of people out of jail. Yeah. And then the third stage is okay. So in the second stage, the Israelis move from the buffer zone to outside yeah. the border. Yeah. So it so the the Palestinians aren't asking for Israel to leave the Gaza Strip as part of the first stage. No, I don't know what what the word would be like pragmatic. Well, I don't you want know, to say reasonable, but it's basically a reasonable document. It's an extremely reasonable document, but but here's the here's the thing about not necessarily wanting them to leave. It's interesting because. The ability to exert military pressure on Israel depends on Israel being there. So it's a funny, it's a funny thing to to negotiate to be able to say, we actually know that if you don't follow this, we're going to go back to war. And so if at any stage before the very end we have to go back to war, it'll be easier to go back to war if you're actually within reach right that's very true yeah i mean i don't know i don't know if i just gave something away that <laughs> may not have been obvious to people but uh Bill burns of the cia's listening he's like wait a second justin <laughs> but yeah i mean that that's i think that's part of what's what's going on here and and it that you know i think if that's not clear to people by now listeners and you know people who are people who are paying attention to this, which is that the only guarantee of this, of any agreement is Hamas's ability to go back to war. That's it. The Americans aren't going to agree, aren't going to do anything. The UN isn't going to do anything. The EU isn't going to do anything. Nobody will do anything. Uh, Israel will agree to this based on their inability to continue the war. And they will agree to this only because they have no military option anymore. And so that's why, like, I, I don't think they do. I, I actually do think that this is, um, I think that this, if this goes on for more months, I do think, you know, Israel's constantly trying to talk about how this is an existential war. And I don't think it has been, I don't think it has had to be. But if it goes on longer and the number of people that they kill and starve is in hundreds of thousands, uh, it's going to be access to Israel is not going to be able to weather that politically, uh, morally, economically, you know, the, that means the war will never end. That means there's no, there's no one, there won't be anyone who ever wants to make a deal. Like it's just, it's, it's in this this we're we are the time frame for for getting out of this with a with a with a deal like this is is shortening and uh i mean i, I 
Th- there and are signs the that it is real. of your state erode to such yeah. a degree yeah. that you can no longer function. Like, is that yeah. is that to you so. uh, like an esoteric concept of no, legitimacy, I, or do you believe that there's a point? I think it's one of the most point... practical. I think it's one of the most practical concepts there is. I think like it's when one you of hit when most... South Africa hits the point. Yeah, like I, it's 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 not just um. It's not just like international. It's not just that nobody wants to relate to Israel. It's it's also that like they're they're not able to function anymore. Like the the way they're behaving, yeah. It's not like a normal society. It's not a normal military. It's no. not. It's it's very um, yeah. It's it's not fragile as a spider's web. Yeah, it's not sustainable. And and and. Yeah, so it's it's a very it's it's I think the time is the timeline is is running out here for something like this. But I do you know I and you guys said this on your electronic intifada live on your Wednesday live stream that there are like as as much as Israel wants to bury it, they were talking about eliminating all the leaders of Hamas. They were talking about them surrendering. Now they're they're humbly putting forward a proposal and the proposal didn't say we want all of the perpetrators of October 7th to hand themselves over to justice. The, the, the proposal was just give us all our people back and we'll stop bombing you for 45 days. And that was like their proposal. So that's already very different attitude than, you know, than we've seen. And so it is possible that they will accept reality at some point it's not impossible that they will take this off ramp i don't think they're ready now well clearly they're not but i you know so did they get their captives clearly no did they dismantle hamas as a municipal government clearly no did they do that to the Qassam brigades as a military force clearly no American and Israeli intelligence numbers suggest a 25% degrading of the fighting force. Um, that's their numbers. More than 85% of the tunnels are intact. That's Israeli numbers. Um, did you defeat the threat? Because that's what Netanyahu said. We can never live beside a state that can threaten us the way that October 7th happened. I got a big no beside that one. And recovered your territory. Did you recover your buffer zones, Israel? No. Also can no the, to that one. Can the settlers go back to the buffer zones? Can they? Um, yeah, they didn't even destroy. I mean, I don't want to say didn't even destroy because the civil defense are the most heroic people. Yeah. The, the paramedics and the civil defense are just the most heroic people. Um, but though they're all completely in ta- in, intact as well, even though Israel's data bank, uh, as, you know, AI data bank would for sure target all their families and kill all their families, which incidentally is what one of the negotiators in Paris, where the Mossad Shabak um, and Egyptian intel guy, he said that Sinwar wanted uh, a ceasefire because they're killing our families which just to me is just a perfect tacit uh, explanation that you're not targeting the resistance in the tunnels. You're killing all their families. And we've seen that in videos released re- released uh, recently as well. I, I put some in yesterday's show where, where they give shout outs to their families, yeah. um, where they communicate with the Israeli war cabinet while firing shells. Like they're very on top of whatever the opposite of lacking command and control is like that um d not or the tank ambush um with the ied in khan yunis they published the video like four hours after the field report so there's no there's no separations there's no like israel's trying to say that the resistance in the south is separated from the north and they're not communicating and they say this bull like uh, Sinwar is surrounded by the prisoners, but we know from the prisoners that Sinwar simply comes and visits them and asks how they are. Um, yeah, what a, just they're just grasping at straws here, and and the diplomatic solution is right is right there, but it's very difficult to see this Israeli state right now doing that. 
they were in a civil war before this war broke out. People were leaving the country because they were like, I can't live in this undemocratic fascist state. Yeah, it's not what they came for. They came for a little bit of liberal West in the East, you know, and this is not. And there was footage the other day of the Egyptians bricking up the Philadelphia corridor, which is the border between Gaza, between Rafa and Rafa, between Rafa, Egypt and Rafa, Gaza. Um, putting up brick walls. Not sure how well a brick wall would do in a stampede, <laughs> but I, I, yeah. I mean, Palestinians have done it before. Hamas broke out, um, yeah. organized a breakout in, I, I want to say 2008, oh. um, where they broke down the wall and people went into Egypt. Um, but I, I want to say that that's like, just from my experience with the Palestinians, that I, I don't see them wanting to go to Sinai just because it's a little bit safer. Um, I think that and it's everybody, not safer and everybody it's a, it's a, it's a trap. I mean, it's a trap that they're the most experienced people yeah. of not falling for the trap. It's a trap for Egypt and it's a trap for, for, for the Palestinians. And yeah, nobody's going to, nobody's going to fall for it. It's, it's not a question. I don't think it's a question of anybody falling for it. It's a question of can Israel, um, intensify their assault on the now concentrated civilian population in Rafa sufficiently that they have to move again. It makes me sick to my stomach just on this, just yeah. even just talking about it on the radio. I, it, it's so brutal. And the, the mathematics of massacre yeah. when you have so many people jammed together is it's just horrifying. Um, even if it's not targeted, even if it's just an errant shell, um, well, I mean, you know, you're killing just, dozens and dozens. But just like the the Jabalia, the six bombs on Jabalia, right? That was that kind of density is what you have now, except it's tense. I mean, yeah, it's gonna be, it's gonna be more intense, more more dead civilians per day than we've ever seen in the past hundred and twenty five days if they go through with it. Yeah. And I, and I worry that they won't, I mean, I don't want to say worry, but I, I think it's possible they don't invade on the ground in the same way yeah, that they they'll did. Just, yeah. They'll just carry out airstrikes and then, and murder and just massacre people. But if they, but again, it's not, um, yeah, this is absolutely horrific to talk about, but it's not, it's not going to solve any of their military problems in the sense that if they're just doing airstrikes, their troops in Gaza City and Khan Yunus will still be reachable. If they withdraw those troops, uh, Qassam will Hamas will move back into those areas. And well, they never left. Like the South, yeah. Israel's term is firm control over yeah. the South, and they're talking about Hamas as a municipal government too, right? Just for the audience that's not. Um, that hasn't been following this. The 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 resistance, the Kassam brigades are are virtually an independent uh, movement. There's a political wing. If anything, like people say that Kassam is the armed wing of Hamas, but it's more appropriate yeah. to say that Hamas is the political wing of Kassam. Kassam is a deeply popular movement in Palestine, far more popular than Hamas is. Um, but nevertheless, Hamas would win an election today, and they would have won one five years ago. They would have won one 10 years ago. And that's the reason why the Americans won't uh, and the Israelis won't allow them to run in elections. And so Israel arrests all their members of parliament and all their student, like when you have student union, um, uh, like voting in your student union at, at your university, they'll come and arrest the, the Hamas slate that wins the student elections, which they do over and over again. Um, and so Hamas has popularity and they would win as a government. They have a big social, um, like social apparatus that they built over decades before joining the armed struggle that um, provides like, you know, healthcare and schooling and, you know, Yeah, fundamental... and it's a good thing they do because UNRWA has now been more or less defunded. So Hamas is the only thing left, even on that side of things now and that's another 
you know, it's another perversion. Like honor what is their tool. Honor what is their tool. Honor what is an imperialist tool for controlling Palestinians based on dribbling aid to them by cutting funding to them. You're inflicting pain, sure, but the you're also imposing a solution that excludes you from having that tool again and that's that's what i see happening over and over again all yeah. of these soft tools of control that that the americans have used to control palestinians they're just they're just burning them one 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 after another and... the the un art was stuff they've been wanting to do this for decades and then it ends up being that that file is going to end up being a joke it already is a joke it's gone from 15 down to 4 and two of them were spotters yeah um, but it came by one of these um like lobby groups this like single issue un watch yeah. group that's like camera or whatever i remember camera the the media organization did the same thing they outed a bunch of journalists um that they said participated in october 7th and then they had to they actually retracted it after um and said oh actually no that it wasn't them after basically marking them for death so we're talking about really thin uh, evidence and we're talking about like uh, you talk we've talked about it before but just like an evidentiary balance that doesn't exist for the other side right like they these nutty settlers um committing crimes doesn't defund the um yeah you the don't jnf do, or whatever you Jewish don't do mass fund. you don't do mass reprisals against uh the the chosen so perfectly reasonable ceasefire that could go into effect and doesn't even have to be for Israel's point. It doesn't have to be a huge stand down because I think with this staged pause, it's possible for Israel to accept the ceasefire. It's possible for Qassam to accept the ceasefire and then come up with the details that are in the, yeah. that, the parts that you don't, that you're negotiating over or whatever, like, um, like just that, stop the genocide and allow people to prepare for winter in their yeah. tents. It's a and very low bar. And that's uh, that'll that won't just stop the fighting in Gaza. That'll stop the problem on the Lebanon border, and it'll stop the problem in the Red Sea. They've yeah. all said they'll they're willing to stand down if you stop the aggression in Gaza. Yeah, very clearly. That's the that's very clear. So I I mean this is gonna come back because Hamas isn't going anywhere and this proposal isn't going anywhere, and uh, Israel's not ready for it. But it's not gonna change, right? Hamas is not gonna say, okay, fine, you can stay. Okay, fine, we'll accept uh, none of our prisoners back. We'll we'll accept, you know, this permanent displacement. They're not no, and, the, po and the population wouldn't accept it either. And the, the population in Gaza, as brutalized as they've been, um, they don't want half measures. They don't want no, two weeks and then the war starts again. Um, you know, they don't want one extra bag of flour um, and, and not and, and in place of getting thousands of their family members released from jail. So you have a steadfastness within the Palestinian population that's a serious factor in this as well. Yeah. And Qassam is a custodian of those national files, like the prisoner file. Um, Qassam is very principled on it. And, and I don't see them giving up. You know, there's that famous yeah. Gilad Shalit Oh, I don't know if it's famous, but <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the graffiti where he they have him like marking um, and he's, those, he's, like, he's... the numbers on the wall of his cell. And then he's got this big, long beard saying like, you know, I, I, you've got I, the I... watches, we've got the time or whatever. I like heard somewhere that it. he's like some kind of Twitch streamer that he's been married and divorced a couple of times. He's just like, he's just like living his life. So that could be all the, that could be all the captives. Yeah, I, I I don't I didn't follow Gilad's life after, but I remember that he got uh, he got some sort of sports job out of out of it right away, which was I always thought was kind of funny because he uh, he did not defend himself during that raid. 
<laughs> famously once your tank is taken out right um okay john i guess we'll call it quits for tonight um there will be plenty more because like yeah my take on this is this is going to be the proposal and it's going to sit there until israel's ready until israel has experienced enough military pressure to accept it yeah and then I they'll try the prisoner, to go back this, on it the civilian part can happen the civilian part can happen. I think the soldier part, the soldier exchange is complicated and and but but there can be a stop to the fighting and there could be a resumption of aid and rehabilitation of the hospitals. Those should be American demands. <laughs> That's Americans what the Americans don't. should be saying. America can't moment. figure out whether Sisi's the president of Mexico or Egypt. So <laughs> Did you see that, John? Did you oh. see Biden? Biden today was <laughs> no, making a Biden was making a speech, and he said, "CC, the president of Mexico, didn't even want to open the border, and I talked to him, and I told him to open the border." So there's all kinds of memes now. People have made fan art of CC wearing Mexican outfits and the United <laughs> the United Latin Republic, and it's got a map of Mexico and each like uh, after the United Arab Republic all kinds of things that are going on. He couldn't on. remember Hamas. Right. When he was talking about the ceasefire agreement, he was like, he he's all froze up. Uh, 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 forgetting Hamas. He forgot who the ceasefire agreement is with. Like elementary yeah. school kids in Toronto know who Hamas is at this well, point. Well, he knew. He knew who Hamas was, but he doesn't anymore. <laughs> they're, they're all right. right. Uh, I'll stop there. Okay, it was good to see you, Justin. Good to see you virtually. Like and subscribe and... Yeah, all of those things, please. And we'll see you in the next Sitzrep. <laughs>